everybody, it's Allison Williams here, your law firm mentor. Law Firm Mentor is a business coaching service for solo and small law firm attorneys. We help you grow your revenues, crush chaos in business, and make more money. Welcome to the Crushing Chaos with Law Firm Mentor podcast. And I want to uh, give a special intro to our guest coming up on today's show. We have Catherine Burmeister, and she is a personal injury attorney, but she has a very interesting and unique perspective. Um, her perspective is born out of her own experience, which I'm going to share with you in just a moment and which we talk about on the, on the podcast, but she started a virtual law firm before virtual law firms were a thing. And she talks a lot about how her personal circumstance led her into a journey of discovering her self-esteem, discovering her self-worth, and most importantly, learning how to care for and maintain her mental health. So here at Law Firm Mentor, we talk about mental health quite a bit because not only am I somebody who went through my own personal mental health uh, struggle and journey and overcoming, but I also counsel and counsel in the global sense, not the psychological sense, lawyers across the country periodically about different mental health issues that they may be going through. Especially when COVID hit, a lot of lawyers were struggling for the first time but a lot of lawyers were already in a state of struggle and they didn't realize it. And for those that did realize it, they didn't know that it was so severe that they needed to do something about it. So I'm particularly drawn to hearing the perspectives of lawyers who are now successful and consultants and who work in the legal space, helping us as lawyers to grow professionally and personally, but also to overcome our mental health challenges. So today our special guest, guest is Catherine Burmeister. And Catherine is a tireless advocate for her clients. She is um, a person who channels her passion into others uh, and also into animal rescue, charities, and other causes. And Catherine never anticipated starting her own business, like a lot of us who have a solo law firm. But after a number of tumultuous events and what she describes as being having the rug yanked out from underneath her for the third time, she finally opened her own law firm in October of 2018 and has never stopped growing ever since. She focuses exclusively on personal injury by giving a voice to those who have been hurt by someone else. And that's something that she has personal experience with. She also has written a book, Overcoming Addiction to the Status Quo. And her book was released in 2020. And that's when she began speaking about self-care, business, and law all at the same time. Her passion for helping others is a theme that crosses between her various presentations, and Catherine has a particular passion for mental health, self-improvement, and emotional intelligence, which she integrates into her legal practice, speaking, and writing. So without further ado, enjoy today's episode. Catherine Burmeister, thank you so much for joining us on the Crushing Chaos with Law Firm Mentor podcast. Thanks for having me today. I appreciate it. So I'm really excited to talk to you because I think that you have an interesting angle on a topic that we've talked about before, which is a virtual practice. But why don't you start with telling our audience why you, as a successful personal injury attorney, owner of your own firm, why you decided to actually create a virtual law firm? So when I first started out on my own, I did have a full caseload, which obviously is huge. Um, it's a huge step in starting out on your own. Um, but even though I had that, I didn't have a lot of money coming in. And I, my goal was to keep everything lean, right? My operating uh, budget and my overhead lean. So to that end, I decided to not have dedicated office space. I decided not to hire people initially. Um, and I don't have any children. So I was very fortunately able to work from home and then have access to a conference room when I needed it for depositions and things like that. Um, on top of that, my clients as a personal injury lawyer frequently don't come to meet with me. I usually go to meet them because they can't get off work or they're injured. Or quite frankly, a lot of people just talk to me on the phone and we build a rapport and they're fine with that conversation. So I didn't need the office space, and even if I could have afforded it, right? So I very quickly learned uh, in the first week that I needed help. So <laughs> I've done everything from legal secretary to an attorney. So I knew it was there. I knew it was likely, but especially running my own practice and having to generate my own cases, I knew I couldn't do it all. So I did look to hire people um, and I ended up going with independent contractors. Of course, the benefit of that is you don't have the benefits that you have to pay to people um, and have them in there for 40 hours a week, right? If there's not enough work to support it. 
So I went on Upwork. I ended up finding paralegals on there and some legal assistants. And I've had the same three paralegals now for over two years. Um, and they actually all work out of state. So I have had the best experience with them. Um, I couldn't ask for anything better. And so uh, not traditional in that regard, right? We're always used to being in the office nine to five, even before COVID, which is when I started my practice. So I started in the fall of 2018. So before remote work was, you know, a mandatory thing, right? Yeah. So I've been working with them um, and it helps me, you know, delegate things that I, I can and keep the things that I have to keep um, to run my practice. So that's how I've been operating. Um, and I continue to operate that way through COVID. There's just still no reason for me to get dedicated office space. And people, I think, are quite frankly, happier having their autonomy. Um, not to say that I'm not managing them, but, you know, if they can be at home and set their own hours, it's something that's worked out for my people and myself. So that's what we've done. Yeah. So I love that you're bringing up some of the, some of the benefits of being in a virtual practice, because when, we, when COVID first happened and a lot of people were for the first time having to work virtual, it was a real adjustment. And yeah. so you, you started out with that, that model and were able to retain that model um, going forward. So I know your firm has grown quite a bit. How has it been since the work demands have increased on your law firm and having virtual team, as opposed to having a team member right there that you can actually see as they're doing the work? It's been great because these people that I, I hired, they're used to working remotely. So there wasn't a learning curve in terms of how to manage their time. Um, you know, how are they going to work at home if they had kids or family, whatever the case may be, they already knew how to manage themselves in that regard. So like I said, I had a full caseload. So, I mean, we hit the ground running. Um, and once I realized that one paralegal wasn't going to be able to do everything for me, I brought on a couple more. Now that's not to say that they all work full time or even close to full time for me. They fill very specific roles. And I've worked in practices where paralegals would work, you know, X number of cases, but they do everything on the case. And then I've worked in places where you have paralegals that do one role for all the cases in the firm. Like and a, I genuinely master and then right. like a, a client right. patients master and that kind of thing. Exactly. So I found that people enjoy doing certain things, right? They enjoy, I have one paralegal that loves medical records. That's her jam. Like she just will go and read through, which is great because that's hugely time consuming. I can't do it until I have to, you know, I get to a point in the case where I really got to do that. Um, Cause I would just never get anything else done. Right. So I have her do that. And while she's doing that, she also starts building out my demand packages to send off to the insurance companies. Mm -hmm. um, so because she likes it, it's not hard for her to do. And she is happy about doing her work. So I found other people that filled the roles I needed in the firm that did enjoy the tasks that I needed filled. Yeah. So Catherine, I, I, I appreciate the fact that you're talking about virtual practice, because I think a lot of freedom comes from being able to design a practice that fits your life instead of doing what you see everyone else doing and following suit. And you and I know that you're a big proponent of not doing that. And in fact, you have a, a book, Overcoming Addiction to the Status Quo, where you talk about that a little bit. So I want to I want to delve specifically into that angle of it. So as someone who decided to go out into practice 2018, before COVID, so we didn't even know that virtual practice was going to be a thing, you decided to create a very different, very special type of law firm that doesn't fit the mold of what most people think of when they think of a law firm. How did you come to that decision for yourself? So I, um, right at the fall of 2018, before I started my practice, I had the rug jerked out from underneath me for the third time in a row. Um, it was a very traumatic uh, uh, situation that happened about a year and a half before. And by the time I got to that point where I'd been jerked out from underneath me the rug, I decided I couldn't go work for somebody again. I just, <laughs> it hadn't really provided the security I thought it was going to. Um, and I had always been someone that wanted to grow with a firm, you know, really invest in it and, you know, grow as an attorney. Um, it just doesn't seem to exist in a lot of places at all, if not at all anymore. Um, I feel like these days in terms of a career or, you know, a business. So I decided what better time to go try and run my own practice. Um, and I knew that it wasn't going to be uh, 
the standard, right, for running a, you know, a virtual practice. But I, at that point, had a shift in my mindset uh, and had gotten to the point where I just didn't care what other po- people thought. <laughs> um, it, I knew I wanted to get to that point in my life, but after a very uh, traumatic situation, I ended up believing that and being okay with that and embracing that. So I set it up the way that I wanted to. Um, And I tried to keep, like I said, my overhead low. And part of that is being remote, you know, being paperless. I have been paperless at other firms up until that point. So that was very easy to do. Um, In fact, like my little filing cabinet is behind me right now. And it's only two drawers and I barely have anything in there. So it's really nice to have that flexibility. But that's really what shifted my perspective on um, being able to do it the way I wanted to was when I had that rock bottom for myself. And when I say rock bottom, I do mean, you know, a rock bottom that is with any other addiction. So addiction to the status quo, I think can be just as uh, detrimental to people as any other standard addiction, sometimes I think worse. I mean, this is not a comparison between who has the worst situation. I only say it as so far as I'm not being flippant when I say addiction. I think it's a socially validated addiction, um, which is probably the biggest problem with it, right? So I hit my rock bottom when I finally just had everything crush, crush me, everything that happened up until that point. Uh, My previous partner had committed suicide. He'd been stealing from clients for years. Uh, The senior associate myself went out on our own trying to salvage the firm. Um, And I ran a practice of Uh, gosh, it was 50 or 60 cases by myself, basically during the aftermath of that. Mm -hmm. And I finally had proven to myself that I could do it. um, And I had the capacity to do it, but the emotional impact of everything caught up with me. And the desire to be some a certain thing for so many people in a certain way, absolutely just caught up with me. And that's when I hit my rock bottom. Um, And that's what shifted my perspective on how I wanted my life, my professional life and personal life to look. And not only did it shift my perspective, but it it allowed me to feel comfortable to embrace that and actually act on it. Yeah. Wow. So that's a very powerful story. Um, Very powerful indeed. In fact, I can only imagine as somebody who, you know, who has dealt with a lot of lawyers and a lot of lawyers going through varying different forms of addiction, how you can very easily draw a parallel between being addicted to the way that things are. And because really, if you think about it, that's what addiction is. It's, it's kind of like a, a, a gradual increase of the way that things are, right? You're drinking too much, you're eating too much, you're spending too much, whatever it is. And then you arrive one day saying, I'm not going to change, I'm not going to change. And something happens and you have no choice but to change but you actually experience that with um with your work situation so of course then thrown into the turmoil of how am i going to support myself and i've got to deal with all these problems and i've got these ethical ramifications of it so i mean just talk to us a little bit about your your journey through positive mental health because i know that that's one of the passions that you have and one of the things you talk about in your book Absolutely. So I think um, as a profession, uh, the legal profession is very antiquated in so many ways. One of them is embracing um, self-care, right? We have so many professional um, obligations to our clients and those around us, which should not be minimized, but it frequently is at the expense of ourselves. And honestly, we can't operate at our best if we don't take care of ourselves. So I've always been a proponent of mental health even before everything happened that led me to having my own practice, but probably even more so afterwards, I was able to step out and say, you know, this is what happened to me. This is what I experienced. You know, I, my, my dark spot and my rock bottom was having to call my husband home from work because I didn't know where I was going to be mentally. Like I was in a very, very dark place. Mm -hmm. Um, I've dealt with anxiety and depression and it's been managed for a number of years and was managed then, but everything just caught up with me. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's not a way to live for anybody, whether you're a lawyer or not, it's not a way to live. So the idea that we almost normalize stress and overworking ourselves and everything that falls into that status quo in our profession, it really takes away from who we can be as individuals, which not only is happier, right? But also better attorneys in the long run. So I'm trying to normalize the conversation about mental health, particularly in the legal profession, but to show people not only does it make you happier, but it can help you be 
better attorney. Um, and I think the problem is a lot of times too, people think they're happy uh, and they're really not, right? They think that happiness is, you know, a million dollar home or a Mercedes or, you know, whatever. And don't get me wrong, money makes things a lot easier, right? We've got to pay the bills. But I don't think in and of itself, it makes people happy. I think they've convinced themselves that inanimate objects make them happy. So really asking people to step back and first ask themselves where they are with their level of happiness and to be honest with themselves about that. And then if they aren't, what can we do to change that um, and avoid having to hit rock bottom like I did? Because it shouldn't be, yes, I grew from it. And yes, I, you know, a lot of good came out of it. But there's no reason anybody has to do that or experience that to be able to make a change in their life. Yeah. Wow. So that's a, a lot that you've said there in terms of in terms of how we as a profession, unfortunately, do create an environment where uh, we are statistically more likely to experience depression, <laughs> to experience anxiety, suicidality, drug use, alcohol abuse. You know, these these very common human foibles are more present in us. And I think it, you know, one of the things I've, I've talked about mental health a lot, because I personally have gone through a period of my, of my life where I went through a very severe depression and I was yeah. suicidal and I'm a recovering alcoholic. So I kind of had the, yeah. trifecta, like all the, all of the self-abuse that one can do to a person because I couldn't meet all of the expectations placed upon me in this, in this very demanding profession. But one of the things that, that I hear um, that's kind of in the thread of what you just talked about there is this tribalism, right? The, mm -hmm. the fact that we, we kind of, as humans, we, we need to be like others around us. And so when you see everyone else overworking, uh, over drinking, over, over stressing, focused on being good enough, fighting to be good enough. And that kind of becomes the way that you are a good attorney. Then there becomes almost a, a, a shame associated with not being that. How do you, how do you suggest that someone deal with that particular aspect of it, that, that kind of negative thought pattern that develops when they're not being that status quo attorney? So first of all, I think we have to recognize that nobody's ever going to be perfect, right? Which is what we're really saying about being the best attorney or the fill in the blank attorney, right? Is being perfect. Nobody is ever going to be because it's impossible. It's a scientific fact. Nothing is perfect. So what are we really trying to accomplish? Is it that we want to be the attorney that earns the most money? Do we want to be the attorney that helps the most people? You know, how are we defining ourselves and what we want out of our profession? And I think a lot of people don't take the time to think about that. Um, or if they do, they are thinking about the money a lot of times, especially in personal injury. Um, and I think, again, that goes back to the idea that inanimate objects are going to bring happiness. And at the end of the day, it doesn't. Um, happiness is different for everybody, but it is ultimately being the best version of yourself is happiness. Because when you look through all the other status quo out there and all the other ideas about what happiness can be or should be, it's supposed to come from within. And that's what really makes people happy that are in life. It doesn't come from external validation, whether that be people or money or you know other things along those lines that are inanimate objects. So it really takes deciding that you wanna be happy, recognizing that you're not and learning what to do to help you know implement those things that can make you happy in the long run. Um, I think one of the biggest things that helps people when I speak to them is, are you ever going to be on your deathbed wishing that you were doing more of what you were doing right now? And I love my job. I love my clients. I love working hard for them. But at the end of the day, if you didn't have any more time left, what would you be doing? You'd be spending it with your family, with your friends, with yourself, doing things that you enjoy. And that's the real answer. That's what you have to create for yourself is that internal world that allows you to be happy while you're doing the other things that are obligations in life. Yeah. So, you know, finding your happy, I think is a real challenge for a lot of people because you're right. Some people, if you ask them what makes them happy, it is oftentimes the trigger of status, power, money that validates them on some level. So they, they, they convince themselves that they'll be happy when they have those things because they'll matter inside and they won't fill up the hole that led them to not mattering or feeling that they don't matter in the first place. So how do you, how, how would you suggest someone who's really trying to find their happy if they're, if they're going to reject the status quo and they're going to reject the definition of lawyer that says overworking, um, you know, over 
over obsessed with money and power, obsessed with things, focused on external instead of internal validation, how would they start to approach the question of what makes me happy if they haven't already defined that by the time they even become a lawyer? Right. So I think, like you said, there's a huge gap between happiness and where most people are right now. Like, how do we get there? So if you don't know what your happiness is, take a look at where you are right now. Is what you're doing working for you? You know, are you having to deal with other addictions to survive your addiction of the status quo, right? Are you drinking more? Are you taking drugs? Are you, you know, doing any number of things to pacify your feelings? Is that really working? Right. And I think people, if they're being genuinely honest with themselves and not just having a knee jerk reaction would acknowledge that it's not. So then your next step is, okay, what's the worst that happens if I let go of these things? Really? I mean, at the end of the day, is anybody going to die? Like there's a reason I'm not a surgeon. There's a reason I'm not a pilot. Okay. (laughs) Like I don't need to be in those professions. And for us as lawyers, like, yes, there's a lot on the line, but stepping back and saying that I'm going to set healthy boundaries is not going to be detrimental to other people, right? It's going to help you be a better person. So as soon as you can let go of checking off the boxes, because I'm a surviving box checker myself, and acknowledge that what you're doing is not working, then you can start backtracking, right? So if I want to be happy, and what I'm doing is not working, what does make me happy? Genuinely, what, what do I want out of life? Is it spending more time with your family? Okay, how do we get to that? Start shifting your obligations off to other people. Start cutting your caseload back. Um, Because again, people say, oh, well, you're gonna be making less money, but does money really make you happy at the end of the day? Or is it the experiences you have with people you care about that maybe money allows for sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. So it's all about honesty. And I think sitting in your feelings, which I know, you know, the vulnerability and feelings makes people kind of go, "Er," you know, that awkward feeling. But the reality is, that's where you're going to find your answers. You have to figure out what matters to you before you can ever start the journey towards happiness, Um, which is what I'm trying to help people do with consulting as well. And coaching is helping them take that first step towards realizing this is not working. What does make me happy and how do we get bridge the gap between the two? Yeah. So I love that you referenced the fact that the first thought that a lot of people are going to have is that cutting back means less money. And I actually like to challenge that notion. Because there are, you know, we, we talk about Pareto's principle, when we talk about, you know, certain financial principles like profit first, and the idea that, you know, if I have a full plate, I'm going to, I'm going to fill my full plate with all the food that the full plate can carry versus if I have a smaller plate, I will still fill the plate, but I will eat less inherently because there's less on the plate. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of the same idea when you start talking about how you can cut back your practice. And you can cut it back in a way that you are more effective and thus more likely to get better settlements and thus be more likely to generate more money when you're actually doing less of the stuff that takes away your joy, your fun, your, your, your interest, your intellectual intrigue. So a lot of times that assumption is just not true, but it's the first thought we go to. If I'm doing less, I'm making less, which of course we know is a fallacy in a lot of practice areas. Yeah, I agree with you entirely. And um, it's hard to let go of, right? Because we measure our worth and our value as professionals, I think, by how much money we make, no matter what practice area we're in. Mm -hmm. Um, So really coming to terms with that, and I don't know if so many people actually ever do. um, But yeah, it's it's hard to step away. First of all, it's hard to say no to cases, right? Especially when you're you're a practice owner, you are just happy those cases are coming in the door. Um, but I have learned in a very short amount of time that some of the cases that maybe on paper look great are not, they're going to take the most time, the most effort. And if you did a cost benefit analysis that you would be losing on it every single time. Mm -hmm. So in and of themselves, they're problematic. Right. And then on top of it, if you have so many cases that you can't really invest the time and effort that you need to, to do quality work you are, you're, you're settling for less than you could get in a case. Um, in my case, I literally am a lot of times, you know, for settlement cases and personal injury. Mm -hmm. Um, but even beyond that, I think it takes recognizing again, that money isn't everything. I mean, you can have tons, think about it. People with millions of dollars, does that make them happy? Not really. I mean, there's a book it's solving for happiness. I believe is the title of the book. And he's a, 
uh, I think he was an engineer and he had moved into the Middle East, the United Arab Emirates with his family. And I mean, they had multiple yachts, multiple homes across the world. And he thought he was happy. And his um, son, I think was like 17, 18, had a routine surgery and he died on the operating table. Mm. Um, and he obviously came face to face with the reality that what would he give up, you know, in his life to have his son back? Money didn't matter at the end of the day, you know, um, again, I'm not downplaying that, it, you know, it doesn't make things easier. It absolutely does. And I understand that my, my thoughts may come from a position of privilege as well, but I think there's also a threshold, right? Once you have a certain amount of money to where you're comfortable and secure, that's really all you need to be able to shift and say, okay, now what makes me happy? Right. Um, because millions of dollars just brings a lot more problems too, right? I mean, you could have a million dollar car and it's great. It's nice, but you're worrying about people hitting it, right? At that point. So, <laughs> I mean, this, I think this perspective that money and inanimate objects bring value, um, I think they bring a lot more problems at the end of the day. Well, we can agree to disagree on that. Um <laughs> I think money can, if you, if you don't grow your mindset to be of, of a place where you can release the money and the money doesn't define you, I think money can create more problems. But um, a, lot of, a lot of the attitude toward money, I think, oftentimes creates the problems that come along with the money because of how people feel about themselves once they have it. I agree. Yeah, no, I think that's a fair statement too. And I, I'm not saying it's impossible to be happy with money, with a lot of money. What I am saying is that I don't think you need money to be happy, right? Um, and I think that, that's really where you have to start is can I be happy without a ton of money? Um, and if the answer is no, you have to really be working on yourself before you can get to that point. Yeah. So we know that, you know, not just, you know, kind of putting aside the conversation about money, you know, work is for a lot of people where they derive their sense of value and purpose. And so if someone is going to try to balance the feeling of um, self validation that comes from being a person of success, contributing in a meaningful manner, helping people's lives through the law with creating a life that doesn't run them over and doesn't require them to work 90 hours a week and doesn't exhaust them mentally, emotionally, physically, psychologically, spiritually, et cetera. How do you suggest that someone balancing those two engage in a process of self-care and what would that look like? Yeah, I think investing in yourself um, professionally and personally. So exposing, depending on where you are in your career and what autonomy you have or don't have, you can still invest in your education. So you feel more confident in your position, your role, um, and expand your, your mental capacity for what you're doing. I, I have a ton of books that <laughs> I'm trying to read, but I'm always doing that. I'm always trying to learn more. Um, I learned so much in a short amount of time because it was just an absolute crash course in practicing and handling, you know, situations that nobody, let alone, you know, an attorney ever might encounter, but you can be very strategic about it, even if you don't experience those things. So teaching yourself how to be a better professional, and then also teach yourself how to be a better person, which is going to the sources that can provide that information the best. So reading other lawyers' books that speak to practicing or be more effective in your techniques as a lawyer. And then also, you know, going to certain books that talk about mental health. And I'm not saying it has to be always warm and fuzzy, because I think a lot of us in the legal profession like more information-based, uh, you know, sources, right? Because we deal with it every day. Um, look to those to provide some guidance. And I find understanding why we are the way we are helps us to reframe and change what we do. So professionally and personally, I think doing that can start you on the course of shifting your perspective on what it takes to make you a good professional and how you value yourself as a whole. Yeah. So if you were to, if someone were to, to take that advice to heart and say, I really want to start working on myself. And one of the investments that they're willing to make is working with someone who can really help them to get to that place. How would you want to, and how would you go about the process of actually working with someone to help facilitate that process? Yeah. So I'm, I am definitely not a therapist. Um, I've been to therapy and continue therapy because it's how I become a better person and maintain um, my quality of life. Um, 
But I think any, everybody can benefit from that, right? You don't have to have a traumatic issue going on or formal diagnoses to be able to benefit from therapy. But I think working with professionals like myself or somebody similar that can appreciate what you're going through um, and have been there and understand the, uh, the demands on you as a professional um, can help. Um, it takes somebody though that's very authentic um, in how they interact with people. It's not a sales pitch. It's somebody who's really willing to sit with you and say, hey, I've been there too, which is the biggest thing, right? I think people being able to understand each other starts with that authenticity of saying, I can appreciate what you've been through. So whether it's working with myself, somebody like myself, or even on your own, because I understand some people that's too big of a leap to put those feelings out there to somebody else, you know, and actually say it to the world. Um, I have some books that one book in particular, that's really been beneficial to me and, um, it's self-esteem and it's written by Matthew McKay, uh, Patrick Fanning. And the reason I like it so much is a couple of reasons. One it's very, it's science-based, but it's not so much a science paper. Um, and it also has very practical resources in it. Uh, to help guide you. And you can jump to different sections that are beneficial. And self-esteem, the title of it is very misleading, right? I thought um, lack of self-esteem was somebody who maybe got steamrolled all the time or somebody who, if they got criti criticized, you know, just would absolutely crumble, right? It's not that at all. Um, there's a lot of the things in here in particular, the idea of shoulds, you know, I should be this or I should not be that. Yeah, I that say has, all the time, don't show yep. over yourself. Right. <laughs> That's a great way to say it. So sh shoulds are my, my down, my thing, my Achilles heel um, and enough, right? I'm not enough. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't done enough. Um, so those two are in here in particular. And so that's, those particular sections have really been, um, beneficial, but also self-criticism, you know, your internal voice, what, how do you talk to yourself? So a lot of the resources in here, I think are beneficial for anybody starting on their own, um, to really start assessing and deciding if they are willing to take that next step, maybe working with somebody. And some people may not have the, you know, desire to do this on their own and want to work with somebody like me that can help walk them through the process of having these conversations and just bouncing ideas off of somebody. So I think it's knowing yourself again, knowing what you need um, to operate at your best level, personally and professionally. All right. So Catherine, if someone wants to consider having a conversation with you about whatever they may be struggling with, how would they get a hold of you? Sure. Uh, they can go to Catherine F. Burmeister, K-A-T-H-R-Y-N, F as in Frank, Burmeister, B as in boy, U-R, M as in Mike, E-I-S-T-E-R. And I spell it out because obviously it's unique in many ways, and I'm sure you'll link that somewhere, but that's the best way to get in touch with me. Um, social media, reaching out to me to work um, with you. I am happy to have more conversations with people about it if they have any questions um, or concerns. So. Yes, we will absolutely put your website into the show notes for this episode. And I want to thank our special guest, Catherine F. Burmeister, and <laughs> welcome her onto the show again. Thank her so much for being a great resource to all of our community, talking about issues that are really important, such as mental health, self-care, and her book in particular, Overcoming Addiction to the Status Quo. Catherine, thank you for being with us. And for everyone listening, I am Allison Williams, your law firm mentor, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Thank you for tuning in to the Crushing Chaos with Law Firm Mentor podcast. To learn more about today's guest and take advantage of the resources mentioned, check out our show notes. And if you own a solo or small law firm and are looking for guidance, advice, or simply support on your journey to create a law firm that runs without you, join us in the Law Firm Mentor Movement free Facebook group. There, you can access our free trainings on improving collections in law firms, meeting billable hours, and join the movement of thousands of law firm owners across the country who want to crush chaos in their law firms and make more money. I'm Allison Williams, your law firm mentor. Have a great day.